first question so consider the following statements with respect to economic survey 2019 and 20 and one more thing remember the economic survey is for the year 2019 and 20 whereas budget is for the year 2021 okay always remember this because sometimes they might give year and confuse you because economic survey has to deal an year that passed it has to give certain statistics about like gdp growth uh, what is the revenue what is the expenditure that happened in the last year and it has to give prescription or measures or suggestions that can be done in the next year so that's why it will be 2019 and 20 whereas budget is from financial year of 20 to 21 that is from march 1st to march 31st okay so this is a cycle so coming back to this first statement economic survey 2019 and 20 was printed in color lavender to signify the new as symbolized by the new rupees 100 note and to depict the synthesis of old and new okay this is the color of economic survey the main print cover uh, this year and second one the theme of this year economic survey is india's aspiration of five trillion economy through wealth creation and trust and third one government is constitutionally bound to present the economic survey but not to follow the recommendations that are made in it so here if you are done uh, you might be stuck with the third one because it is saying constitutionally bound but you might have never heard uh, any constitutional article related to economic survey but there is no such constitutional article for this so that is why economic survey is not constitutionally bound it is just an exercise that is done by the government it's a kind of an official report that is given by government so that is why third statement is wrong so it is not bound to submit not even bound to follow so third statement is wrong here and the first and two both are correct so the first one important to remember every year economic survey will be printed in an uh, the cover page of economic survey will be printed in a color and a specific color signifying certain importance for example in 1819 they have printed it on a blue color signifying blue sky thinking that means the economy thinking should be like blue sky with uh, limitless opportunities and before that it was pink color signifying the importance of women and uh, uh, initiatives that are like beti bachao beti padao to arrest the child sex ratio so that way every year it comes with a unique color so you have to know the color and the color significance so this year it is lavender and lavender signifies basically the mix of new and old so basically here in this economic survey also they are presenting the ideas which are a mix of old traditional ideas and new technologies so that is why old and new synthesis and at the same time there was a new hundred note uh, was uh, submitted in 2019 with the color lavender so that also signifies new so that's why the first statement and second statement is also true that we are aiming already we had the objective that by 2024 we need to have this uh, five trillion dollar economy so the tool to achieve that is wealth creation that too with the trust so this is the theme of the economic survey this year and uh, one more thing always remember like economic survey is very very important from both prelims and mains point of view from prelims you will at least get one or two either on the stats data or the you know patterns like for example if there is gdp growth whether it is steadily decreasing or increasing what about the investment ratio or what about the savings ratio like how it is from 2004 to now is it steadily increasing or steadily decreasing you don't need to remember the data points but you need to know the trends this is very important for prelims from economic survey and for mains usually if you read there will be many ideas that you can use directly in your answer like quoting as economic survey said this is an idea like for example uh, promoting entrepreneurship at the grassroots level so this kind of information you can get by economic survey so try to read economic survey if possible if not the entire survey at least the summary of each chapter okay so second one consider the following statement with respect to thali economics idea presented in this year economic survey so this is again very very uh, trending one thali economics at that time because this is the first time economic survey came up with a new word and whenever it comes up with these kind of words that gets so much attention in the media so that's why this might be very important this year so first statement thali economics provides a criteria to estimate the poverty in india with more accuracy and sensitivity okay and the second one according to economic survey 2019 20 the affordability of wedge thali decreased while that of non wedge thali increased in the time period of 2006 to 20. so kindly once again read and mark your answer 
I guess it is very easy. So if you have already heard about this term and had a rough idea, then it is very easy to mark. So if you are done here, if you see the first statement, uh, this is wrong option actually because Thali economics, it might appear like it is a tool to estimate the poverty, but it is not. It is just an statistic data statistic that is used by economic survey to show that the inflation was in control basically that is the objective so what they did they compared this thali you all know right that uh, the plate of meals north indian thali and south indian thali so that meals cost basically they say from 2006 to 20 it has decreased so that way people are getting now more better nutrition that is what economic survey want to project and it became so controversial because no one accepts like really the Thali rate has been decreased and you can't estimate the state of entire Indian nutrition with the help of one Thali. So that is a problem. So that's why the first statement is completely wrong here. Whereas the second statement is also wrong because it said that economic survey said both veg Thali and non veg Thali both have actually their affordability has decreased sorry affordability has increased both of because affordability means the cost is decreased affordability is increased because you are able to afford because of the incomes of the people and the less price of the thalis so that's why both have both the prices have decreased but veg thali prices decreased even more than non veg thali that is the only thing you have to remember so second statement also wrong so it is answer is d none of the above so now uh, coming back to economic survey, there are few things like highlights. We will see that. So here the theme as we've seen already India's aspiration of economy of 5 trillion with the theme of wealth creation and it has 11 chapters. So as I said, we'll try to finish this 11 chapters in 11 slides like in every class. We will have one slide for one chapter from tomorrow. Okay, so coming back to economic survey. So some basic details. It is basically a report official report of the government that gives you a uh, picture of state of economy in the past one year and the key challenges it expects and the solutions or measures possibilities to overcome those challenges. So this is basically the framework or objective of economic survey and it is prepared by economic division of Department of Economic, Sur economic Affairs and uh, usually there will be a chief economic advisor appointed. So under him this report will be prepared. So right now it is Krishnamurti Subramanyam right now also he is a CEA for us and then uh, there is no constitutional uh, boundness that I've already discussed. So now we'll come to the important recommendations or important observations that economic survey made this year. So first among them is wealth creation that too. They explained this wealth creation by invisible hand and hand of trust. So what are this invisible hand? I guess most of you know that there is an Adam Smith economist who proposed this concept invisible hand. So that means basically market decides the welfare of the economy. So market decides the prices and market decides the competition everything. So uh, economic survey is saying instead of government controlling leave it to the market in most of the sectors at the same time just leaving it to the market is not enough. Along with that we need to have certain kind of trust. This trust is something ethical and social aspects it basically deals with ethical and philosophical dimensions for example when we say trust like people should have trust on the corporate sector and the corporate sector should be guided by certain ethical principles like providing the account deposits or accounts of its organizations promptly to the regulators and similarly it should maintain transparency in its corporate accountability to its shareholders so these are kind of ethical principles for example tata is there when you compare Tata with Reliance, many people say Tata is more ethical. So this kind of trust, if you build with the people, then along with the people, company will also grow. So that is how economic survey is suggesting that you can create more wealth in the country by having both market led economics and with the help of trust. So that is a thing. And here, as I said, invisible hand. There are certain tools or certain measures it suggested for example like giving equal opportunities for new entrants so how you can give that by leaving it to market and similarly fair competition and ease of doing business and then trade for job creation scaling up the business uh, banking sector so these are the something that are provided by the invisible hand now we'll see the uh, characteristics of the trust factor so here trust is uh, economic survey projects trust is something as a public good 
like for example education health like how education and health are public goods similarly economic survey is saying trust is also a public good so kindly remember this it is saying trust as a public good and that too it says the more you use the trust it gets better so that is the important thing and important uh, characteristics are non excludability non rival consumption non rejectable that is uh, without imposing any financial cost or greater cost on citizens citizens should enjoy the benefits of trust basically trust thing for example if you are paying 15 rupees for every service to not to have corruption then that is not public trust so that is an example similarly non rival consumption marginal cost of supplying the public good to extra citizen should be zero and then finally non rejectable that is collective supply of all citizens means it cannot be rejected if that means like if there are many people group of people for whom you are supplying certain services or goods and if they people are expecting something you can't take the decision against to that so that is non rejectable so as i said trust is a public good which grows more and more by repeated use and it takes time to build so that is about trust so next thing undermining markets so it is saying government intervention has actually damaged the economy more than it helped so that is why it is saying economic survey is suggesting government should intervene as less as possible the example it is quoting is essential commodities act in essential commodities act basically government imposes certain restrictions on exports on storage buffer stocks so this is hurting the indian farmers so that is the uh, meaning of this suggestion and next you have creation of jobs and growth so here what it is saying so to create more jobs don't just go for only made in india and that to make in india don't just go for directly building everything from scratch you can actually have more jobs by having assemblies also here like even if you don't produce you can import them but assemble in india so that you will get value enhancement and you will get at least job creation for at least that sector so it is asking to include assembling in india into the make in india scheme this way make in india can be expanded and people can benefit that is the next suggestion and then you have targeting ease of doing business we all know that in ease of doing business we have improved drastically like from above 120 position we have come to 63rd but at the same time on four or five parameters we are the worst like we are about 160 rank out of 190 in enforcing contracts enforcing contracts is about like if you have any law and uh, if anyone is violating and if you go to supreme court or something then it takes so many years to enforce that contract through supreme court so that is very weak in india so in enforcing contracts or in registering property and similarly paying taxes and starting the business all these four parameters india is at the last rank so now india has to focus on these areas to improve further that is the other suggestion and then about blank nationalism bank nationalization so we all know like in 1970s we uh, made all private banks as public sector banks and we have now the domination of public sector banks so economic survey is saying well good but you shouldn't have many public sector banks like instead of having 20 odd public sector banks have four or five which are globally dominant so if you see right now in the top 100 list sbi has 55th rank in the world like in terms of capital and in terms of size so it is saying create sbi like banks like four or five instead of having 20 small banks so it is basically asking to consolidate the banks it is not asking to privatize because they might confuse you in option like it might ask you saying economic survey suggests to privatize the public sector banks but that is not the suggestion it is saying consolidation of the banks to form or merger of the banks to form less number of public sector banks so that is bank nationalization and then you have privatization and wealth creation so here you all know about strategic disinvestment right so economic survey is supporting that saying that you can have more wealth by actually privatizing certain public sector units and the example it is quoting is bpcl and then finally you have thali economics so here it is trying to show that the affordability of indian vegetarian thalis has improved 
like especially for vegetarian it improved by 29 percent and for non-vegetarian it improved by 18 percent that means basically it is trying to say that the economic development is more inclusive and it is helping the people to afford food and hunger problem is being addressed and it is not severe as been projected by other indexes so this is something economic survey want to highlight and these are the main highlights of economic survey and these are the top 10 ideas that are presented in this year economic survey we have already discussed all of this but just we'll go through quickly like as i said wealth creation benefits all it is not something that is only for uh, ambani or uh, only for uh, mukesh ambani or uh, uh, birlas and next thing a market enables the wealth creation this is the invisible hand at the same time you need to have invisible hand also associate with trust so trust is a public good that gets increased with use this is something we already seen and then it is saying wealth creation should happen at the grassroots level that means in the districts and in the villages the wealth creation should happen more and more people should come to entrepreneurship and then you have pro business policies give equal opportunity so government should instead of intervening it should not intervene and if at all it intervenes it should be for equal opportunities and then you have uh, remove anachronistic government intervention the essential commodities act that is the main example of this and then you have as i said assemble in india should be integrated into make in india and then finally there are some parts in ease of doing business like enforcing contracts like uh, paying for the property restring the property these sectors we need to work even more and then finally banking sector subscale compared to the economy this i said consolidation of banks like we need to have five or six main banks instead of having 20 odd and finally you have tali economics where it is saying affordability is getting increased from 2006 to 2020 so that is about economic survey main highlight when does who declares the disease as public health emergency of international response first one if there is a risk to public health of other states through international spread of disease second one if it requires a coordinated international response to curb the disease third one if it has a potential to impact least developed countries healthcare system and lives significantly so this is again very tricky question and uh, yeah kindly once again read the statements and mark your answer and the main context behind asking this question is you all know uh, like uh, just one month before there was huge controversy saying who is acting on behalf of china and it is uh, china that is influencing it and the main reason they gave or justification us gave is that who declared coronavirus as an international uh, public health emergency quite late instead of doing it much before like it did it around january 30 or in the february first week so because of this it became a very uh, important topic so we need to know what are the conditions on which who will declare a disease as a public health emergency of international response and we also need to see how many times till now it was declared that also we need to see and what is the impact so part of that this is one aspect of the question so if you have marked the answer so here uh, if you can see the first and second statements make some sense because it is saying you are declaring it as public health emergency of international response that is the word itself says that is that means whenever the disease is a threat to many countries then you can declare it because only then you will treat it as international thing so that is why the first statement is correct second one for any disease of international scale you obviously need coordinated response because only one country cannot stop this disease like coronavirus so you have to have international coordination that's why the first and second are correct however the third statement if you see it is saying potential to impact least developed countries healthcare system and life significantly it doesn't make sense because it doesn't who or any organization doesn't differentiate in disease affecting least developed developing or developed countries so that's why the third statement is wrong here and the one and two are correct so the answer is a now we'll see this in detail international health regulations so that is also important from this uh, this point of view 
and uh, yeah these are some technical terms i uh, thought like these are very relevant and this might, there might be a question in uh, prelims also on this you need to know and understand these words in detail so that's why i've mentioned this in the slide so like if you see the first stage of any disease is outbreak so first an outbreak happens then it got then it usually get converts into endemic and then it forms into an epidemic and final stage is pandemic so how it will go we'll see so first thing outbreak so outbreak is basically if it is greater than like uh, first of all we'll see first what is endemic meaning then it will be better to better or easier for to understand outbreak endemic means it is localized it is particular to one certain region or state or district for example if you remember we have discussed about uh, cancer, cancer monkey fever disease and i said it was endemic to karnataka that to karnataka forest so that means that disease doesn't happen anywhere other than that area so then you call that disease as endemic or you can see endemic species that means they are only found in that area so similarly if a disease happens in only certain area then you call it as endemic as i said here also it is something that belongs to particular people or particular country or region for example if you see dengue fever dengue fever is not something that happens worldwide it happens mainly in africa asia america and caribbean north in europe and uh, north america because they don't have much these kind of mosquitoes which transmit this so that is why it is endemic to tropical areas basically then outbreak outbreak is something you are unable to control and it is rapidly spreading uh, but in that area itself so then you call it as outbreak for example the nipa virus was an outbreak so that is outbreak and then you have epidemic the next stage of outbreak is epidemic like if an outbreak can be still controlled for example nipa virus was controlled but if you are unable to control it and then it quickly spread to other areas as well and it is putting lot of strain on the uh, health infrastructure then you call it as epidemic as you said epidemic is disease that affects large number of people within a community or population and region like for example even the local transmission happens and it spreads and you can't able to trace the transmission then you can call as epidemic and then when epidemic becomes a pandemic it is when it goes to multiple countries or at least one country of each continent when it spreads to multiple continents like asia africa europe america if it spreads to everywhere then it is pandemic it's easy to remember like in pandemic p is there that means passport so if if an uh, if it is spreading with the to the countries by a passport then that means it, the disease has become a pandemic so if it is restricted to one area but it is out of the control then it is epidemic if it is only to one region particular to one region then it is endemic so outbreak is something above endemic and below epidemic so this is the classification of uh, diseases so as i said uh, it has recently announced this wuhan coronavirus as public health emergency of international response so the main impact will be like whenever you discover a disease if you announce that as a public health emergency as soon as possible you can arrest the spread of the disease that much better and you can also try for going vaccines much earlier than that for example we all know this coronavirus was discovered in china around december but however it took one and a half month almost for wh4 to declare so by that time the international flights were there travel were there adversaries were not issued so it got spread to all the parts of globe so that is one impact how it had so that's why it is very important so as you can see this public health emergency of international response or international concern is basically defined in this international health regulations and the definition is that an extraordinary event which is determined to constitute public health risk to other states by international spread of disease first thing second one require a coordinated international response as i said if it is going to spread to many countries or if it requires the international coordinated response then you can declare it as public health emergency and then the impact what the impact will have to have if you declare it as public health emergency then it will lead to more awareness and you will have more public health measures and similarly the funding will be improved for the health infrastructure and then you can start uh, researching on the vaccines if you feel it is as a deadly disease so this is a kind of things you can do and another thing countries can impose trade and uh, travel restrictions for example if you know like from february 20 that is from before the lockdown 
we have announced international travel ban so this is something that we can do much early when who declares it as public health emergency so that is a impact or importance and so far if we see we have declared or who has declared uh, uh, diseases five times as global emergencies like the first one started with 2019 swine flu and then 2014 polio because there was a sudden spike in polio and then in 2016 zika virus this we have already discussed in the class so this is a kind of important disease that not because of indian uh, outbreak but it mainly happened in the latin americas and then you have ebola in 2014 once that was deadly outbreak and then in 2019 there was again a resurgence but however it was controlled in africa itself so these are the five times and then recently you had the coronavirus declared as public health emergency so that is was the sixth time and uh, just a small thing about international health regulations so these health regulations are basically a binding international legal agreement like uh, what happens is if you have any outbreak in your country then it is your responsibility according to this regulation to inform the who and to provide them with all the information and to contain it or to make take measures that it shouldn't spread to other countries so this is, are some of the binding commitments according to the so now we'll see union budget so we have uh, completed the economic survey and uh, the disease so consider the following statements with respect to union budget 2020 21 so first one article 112 of the constitution provides for laying down of the statement of estimated expenditure of the government of india only before parliament in respect of every financial year that is first april to 31st march second one budget 2021 is woven around four prominent themes that are aspirational india economic development caring society and blue economy and third one ministry of railways to start krishi udan for transport of perishable goods on national and regional routes so here as well like you need to know a bit about union budget the basic framework concept and then like uh, what are the themes so here if you see uh, the trap in the first statement is i said it is only for expenditure but if you see in a budget both revenue and expenditure both are presented so that is why the first statement is wrong so it is about the statement annual financial statement deals with both annual revenue and annual expenditure and it is presented both in parliament like both houses it can be presented in both houses so that's why the first statement is wrong because of that word and second one uh, if you have seen the budget at least highlights it is only on three themes that is aspirational india economic development and caring society there is no blue economy so this is again a trap so second one is also wrong and then finally i'm saying udan udan if you have remember it is about airports and civil aviation so why ministry of railways will be there ministry of railways is with kisan rails so kisan rails is the concept so that's why even the third statement is wrong so all the statements are wrong here the answer is d so now we'll see this in detail like highlights of budget so a little bit facts about this like you all know this was the second um, like uh, nirmala sitaraman is the only second person second woman to in the history of india to present the union budget like earlier it was presented by indira gandhi but at that time she was only holding uh, pm and finance portfolio that was temporary but as if you see as an permanent position of finance minister then nirmala sitaraman is the first finance minister woman finance minister to present the budget second thing uh, unique thing is like usually we present it in the form of carry the economic files in the form of a briefcase but first time she departed and she went into a traditional custom of uh, they call it as uh, bahi khata so this is not to remember but just know these facts these are something that happened for the first time that's why i'm covering this as well then the budget is nothing but annual financial statement and the constitutional article that provides for this budget is article 1112 okay 112 and uh, the three themes the main themes of the budget this year are uh, aspirational india economic development and caring society so in aspirational india 
basically we are trying to improve ease of living like how we did for ease of doing business so basically the better standards of living with covering all education health and jobs that is employment and then you have economic development here basically in the economic development the prime minister is talking about inclusive development that is by sab sabka saath sabka vikas and sabka vishwas these are the traditional famous dialogues so here he will he is trying to make the economic development more inclusive by focusing on rural sector agriculture in agriculture also fisheries sector so these are the uh, sectors that are covered under this theme and then you have third theme that is caring society so caring society is something about social development like for example persons with disabilities uh, or old age people or with uh, certain vulnerabilities say cst communities so programs for them so these comes under caring society so basically they didn't do anything new they segregated the existing schemes under these three headings so this is something we have to remember so these are the three components under which they have uh, reformulated the existing schemes and introduced some new ones so we'll see the schemes also under these three themes so that will be it will be easy for us also to remember so first one as i said aspirational india so here i have covered aspirational india is about improving the better standards of living in terms of per capita income in terms of accessing the services and all so here if you see an agriculture sector and uh, one more thing kindly note that i'm not covering existing schemes i'm only covering here the new schemes that are introduced in this budget so that's why there are very less in agriculture but if you see the budget document there are many okay so if you see the new schemes in agriculture the first time uh, they have kept a target to increase the fresh production to up to 200 lakh tons that by 2023 and second thing railways is introducing kisan rail okay in kisan rail they will have an a cold storage system where they can transfer the perishable goods so that way they want to give uh, like ease of access for farmers to the markets so that is first thing next thing similarly we have udan for passenger transport now civil aviation is trying to implement kisan udan that is to use planes for agriculture cargo so to transport the produce in terms of northeast like in reaching to the northeast or northeast produce if there is any horticulture produce to reach it to the mainland markets we are going to use civil aviation so that is that and then you have wellness water and sanitation so in this they have launched a new movement called fit india movement okay to basically to fight this non communicable diseases like heart diseases and uh, lifestyle oriented diseases so that's why you would have seen there are many things before corona they have done in fit india scheme and similarly they are uh, putting more uh, focus on sanitation like you all know jal jeevan mission and jal uh, ministry one ministry was uh, formulated by amalgamating various other ministries so that is scheme under that and then you have education sector so in education sector for the first time they are saying that uh, graduates can have internship opportunities with the urban local bodies like engineering graduates can go and do intern for 6 months with ghmc like bodies so that is first important scheme and then you have insat exam so this is something to attract asian and african countries to study in india so to get better rank for indian universities in the world rankings that is second thing and then finally budget is proposing for the first time national police university and national forensic science university for the first time and then budget is also saying every district we will have a medical college to increase the number of doctors and to increase the number of seats that to by associating it with the hospital and to construct them in a public private partnership model so to expand public private partnership model to the uh, medical colleges as well so these are the educational sector aspirational india reforms or initiatives that were launched in budget so now we'll see the theme 2 that is economic development in this the important initiative is national technical textiles mission so this is important technical textiles is different from normal textiles we have further slides where we will discuss this in detail so this was something that was launched by budget next thing we have already discussed about national infrastructure pipeline so they are going to implement that where they are going to put more money like about 112 crores lakh crores in infrastructure development and then you have indian railways so here also they are going for more electrification and signaling system investment in railways and then finally in the energy sector they are going to start this prepaid smart meters where they are going to expand this 
to cover the losses of distribution companies if you know right now all the distribution companies are in losses so to avert them they have in introduced schemes like uday and all but they are not working so one of the solution they are proposing is this prepaid smart meter where you will first have to pay like you do recharge for your phone so that is prepaid smart and you can uh, control this loss of transmission and distribution losses also like if there is any cheating or if there is any illegal stealing of electricity that can be controlled so that is a major initiative and then you have construction of data center parks this is also very very important initiative you all would have heard about this data as a uh, new oil or data localization scheme so to make sure that works in india they are building new data center parks because we don't have very good data servers in india where you can store large amounts of data so to enable that ecosystem government is trying to build data center parks by uh, giving incentives to private sector and then finally national mission on quantum technology and applications this also something we have already covered but here also they have allocated for 8000 crores for 5 years so this is something they are trying to go for the next stage technologies this is in economic development then you have caring society so here they are again uh, they uh, shown the success of beti bachao and beti padao and they said they will implement it in more districts and with a larger allocation of amount and then you have uh, greater amount allocated to nutrition related programs like mid day meal and all and uh, finally sc sts obcs these are just a scheme amount there is nothing much to remember here but they have provided good amount of money allocation for these persons of with disabilities and vulnerable communities and these are the other initiatives for example uh, they are going to constitute indian institute of heritage and conservation as a deemed university to promote art and culture conservation so this is something like national police university and forensic university they are trying to do this and uh, another very very important initiative from ministry of tourism and art and culture is to develop the five archaeological sites you all know like uh, uh, there are some archaeological sites related to indus valley civilization and some of them in the south india so these are the five rakigari hastinapur shivasagar dolavariya adichanallur kindly do research on this five and know what is the unique importance of these sites if government is proposing to revive these five sites then definitely there will be question on any one of them or even five of them in upsc prelims because upsc will focus on the events or initiatives that are there in news that means there is very significant historical importance to these sites so kindly research more on them and then finally there is an important initiative called taxpayer charter like how we have citizens charter they are now going to introduce taxpayer charter where there are certain rights certain duties will be listed for a taxpayer like how we can approach if there is any case and faceless tax assessment all of these are being part of tax pay charter so they are going to make tax paying as a less burden and less compliant system and then finally the tax lapse so for the first time uh, finance minister has introduced two systems like direct tax lapse or you can avail certain exemptions so there are two systems either you go avail the exemptions and pay less tax or directly say if you are falling between 7.5 to 10 or 5 to 7.5 if you are falling in that bracket then you will have direct a tax bracket range that is less so either if you adopt this or that but only problem is if you choose one you cannot go back to the other that is the only controversy so these are the important initiatives that were announced in this year budget so that is it about budget and economic survey now we'll see this national technical textiles mission this is also very important that's why i've covered this in separate slide so first option it is an initiative to boost indigenous technical textiles ecosystem in india under ministry of science and technology okay second one technical textiles are defined as textile material and products manufactured primarily for their technical performance and functional properties rather than aesthetic and decorative characteristics okay third one the time period for this mission implementation is from 2020 to 2024 okay just yeah once again see these statements i know these are again very tricky and you need to know perfect details of this mission only then you will be able to answer this but still try if you have already read then very good so here first thing you have to remember in the first statement i have kept an deliberate trap by saying technical so 
I have associated with Ministry of Science and Technology, but unfortunately, it is not. It is not associated with Ministry of Science and Technology, but it is under Ministry of Textiles. Okay, so the first statement is wrong. So don't always think or guess because it is technical, so it will fall under Science and Technology. So to make you more aware of these kind of traps, I'm doing these kind of statements. And second one, this is absolutely correct. Basically, textile tech. Technical textiles are something like they are used for technical and functional purposes. Like I will give you one example. For example, like uh, have you seen a uh, thread-like structure on uh, aircraft carrier to arrest the aircraft when they are landing? Because you know that aircrafts come with a great speed, and you have very less size in the aircraft carrier to make them land. So they will use certain catapult where it will have certain rope. So that is basically for strength. So that can pull. any number of tons of weight so that is for strength so there you are using the textile for strength so if you use it for certain characteristics then you would call them as technical textiles similarly you use certain ropes in space also to perform certain functions so these are specifically for strength flexibility so these kind of functions if they are then you call as technical textiles similarly even in uh, biomedicals like for example for surgery there are certain specific textiles that are used uh, fibers are used for stitching because you normally can't use the cotton one so that is the importance of this technical textiles so there are n number of applications right from health to agriculture space and all so that is why it's a growing industry we all know we are already strong in normal textiles so that's why government aim is to also become a leader in this technical textile and second thing right now 70% of india's imports of technical textiles comes from china and other countries so to avoid that we have formulated this mission so that's why the second statement is correct the normal textile usually focus on like clothing where you have aesthetic and decorative things okay so that is the difference and third statement is also correct it is about 2021 to or 2020 to 24 it is basically remember it with nda time okay once the bjp government goes this mission is gone so it is basically 2 and 3 now we'll see in this detail so the same thing as i said it is basically to give a thirst of wide variety of textiles like healthcare infrastructure automobiles defense and agriculture and uh, to position india as global leader this also we have discussed and this one like right now we are importing about 16 billion every year so to convert that we have done this and technical textiles are functional fabrics that have applications across various industries and uh, like 12 technical textile segments are identified like agrotech media tech build tech all this and uh, there is an example also here like the the one which you use for the seat belts or air bags all of these are technical textiles okay and it has four components these are very important so we'll see first component deals with research development and innovation okay first is research development and innovation and it is allocated 1000 crores and research will be at both fiber level and application level so like application and fiber level and then finally development of indigenous machinery will be focus for research area second component will be on the promotion and development of the market so second is marketing basically remember it as marketing so once you have researched and developed a product then you need to have a market so in india itself they will try to promote the market and third component is for exports promotion so now if you want to become a global leader then you need to have a significant market share in the globe so that's why you will promote market share in the globe that is exports promotion with certain amount and all and then finally fourth component is about education training and skill development because we have more skill in normal textiles not in technical textiles and you need to have greater skill force or labor force in technical textiles so that's why skill training and uh, education so four components remember this way first for a textile you need basic thing is research and development second marketing in domestic third exports promotion fourth one to sustain that you need skill training so this way four components they are focusing and then sixth one consider the following statement with respect to new mascot of national games 2020 okay so first one the new mascot announced was flame throated bulbul second one it is endemic to western ghats only third one it is state bird of goa i know this is very very uh, like difficult question because it is somewhere in the 
margins of the news it is not that highlighted but it is very important trust me because whenever there is any significant games that happen in india then there might be a question so you need to know what is a mascot and what is the importance of that animal so here i have kept all the three statements as correct so it is an ask uh, the name of that mascot is flame throated bulbul and it is found only in western ghats that is right from maharashtra to kerala including tamil nadu and it is an state bird of goa so all the statements are correct here so the answer is a so this flame throated bulbul is also called regionally as rubicula okay i'll show you first the picture so this is that bird so you can see here uh, it is called flame throated because its throat is like that can you see that specific color red color so that's why it is called as flame throated so this way whenever you even learn or read about any bird or anything special try to see the image so that immediately you will be able to connect and remember in the mind if not it will be very difficult to know about that so that is flame throated bulbul so it is basically in uh, rubigula and state bird of goa and now it has been chosen as mascot of national games that are actually planned to be held in this september to november but we don't know the status and uh, this is endemic to uh, western ghats western ghats and southern peninsula india and uh, like the iucn status is least concern there is not much impact of this like it is not endangered or something and in wildlife protection act it is in schedule 4 that means it has least protection it is protected but is not that of high priority so as we have discussed this india's wildlife protection act here so i have mentioned some importance of schedules also like if you see schedule 1 and part 2 of schedule 2 both provide absolute protection like if you commit any or if you kill any bird then the penalties will be highest the main species like tiger elephant or uh, threatened species all fall under the schedule 1 and part 2 of schedule 2 okay even the great indian bustard all of this fall under this category then you can have second second list that is schedule 3 and schedule 4 these are also protected but the penalties are not that much high they are very less and it is not that strict in terms of enfor not enforcement but in terms of fine and punishment okay and then finally you have schedule 5 this covers basically the animals which can be hunted on a specific permission okay and you can also have vermin species here if you have uh, in, heard in the recent news there is a uh, talk about vermin vermin is something species which are in large number and that are damaging the human population or ecosystem for example rats rats is a vermin species or crows are sometimes considered as vermin species so you can get permission and kill them if they are threatening the ecosystem or human habitation and then you finally have schedule 6 this is also important schedule 6 deals with plants okay about cultivation and protection for and uh, certain threatened plants so always remember schedule 1 to schedule 5 are animals schedule 6 is plants and in that also schedule 1 and part 2 of schedule 2 are high protection and then schedule 3 schedule 4 of same level and then finally schedule 5 is vermin where you can hunt this is very important like they will give the species and they say these are part of schedule 5 whether they can be hunted or not so you need to able to identify so that is about indian wildlife protection act and seventh one consider the following statements with respect to international maritime organization international maritime organization is an international body independent of un that regulates international shipping first statement second one the imo is not responsible for enforcing its policies there is no enforcement mechanism to implement the policies of imo third one imo is headquartered at brussels belgium uh yes this is also again difficult question like complete fact based if you know you can mark it or you need to know at least one fact among them to mark the correct answer first statement is absolutely wrong here because imo is an un body it is not an independent of un so basically it is an un body but there is another organization called international shipping organization so that is an independent body so every time you need to know what is part of un what is not part of un yesterday or day before yesterday we have uh, talked about international civil aviation organization so that also i said it's a un body so but it uh enforces or it tries to implement the chicago convention so similarly in the shipping you have maritime organization and second thing maritime organization doesn't deal with uh this thing like standards of shipping or something like civil aviation it basically talks about uh safety safety and uh, regulation of environment protection of 
pollution of water with respect to ships that is international maritime organization whereas shipping organization deals with other responsibilities this also you need to know the difference between shipping organization and international maritime organization and the second one is correct it doesn't have power to enforce any policies the policies will be enforced only when countries sign to conventions so every time imo formulates a policy then that formulate the policy is converted to convention and when that country is signed that then it will be legally binding so imo as such doesn't have but it tries to regulate it and the permanent headquarters is in london that is again important this is one of the un body that is headquartered in un sorry in london because majority of them in either in geneva or in new york yesterday also i have said that icao is headquartered at do you remember it is in montreal canada okay whenever there is distinctive city try to remember civil aviation is located in headquartered at montreal canada whereas maritime in london so you can uh, like associate maritime with british power because british is maritimely very important and significant they have this influence to keep the secretariat in london so that's why the third statement is also correct so here it is 2 and 3 as a sorry 2 only is the correct answer that is a so the context for international maritime organization question is uh, first of all for the first time they have listed that india is one among the 10 states with the larger interest in the international sea bond trade because we have about 70% of our energy imports and about 80% of our goods and services are done through sea so that's why we are one of the countries very much interested in maintaining this law rule of law and this rules based order and all and that's why we say of indo pacific and all so that is one thing second thing what happened in uh, this february month uh, this imo has come up with a new law making that ships shouldn't uh, burn fuel with sulfur content more than 0.5% that too starting from january 1st and unfortunately till now right now the current status is 3.5% as the limit that means ships can burn fuel which has sulfur content up to 3.5% and suddenly imo said you have to reduce it to 0.5% so it is possible is it feasible to have such kind of drastic reduction and the main impact is on india because there are many indian ships or the ships that transport indian cargo where they have to undergo complete refitting or they have to transform their engines so that will have huge economic cost and also the logistics cost for india will increase unfortunately india was not present at that time when this decision was made so that's why this was a news india was a member india has a, uh, a representative that needs to be there in london but unfortunately from last 25 years no one was appointed so that's why we didn't had any control while the rule was framed and once rule was being implemented then we had the problem so that's why this controversy was there like what india what india was doing while the rule was framing and why is india not defending its interests and india being the largest one of the 10 states that having significant interest still it is not doing enough so these questions came that's why we need to know more about imo so as i said uh, it is established in 1948 and uh, started operations mainly from 1959 and the headquarter is london and the main function or responsibility is to safety and security of international shipping and the second important function is to prevent pollution from ships so environment pollution related to ships and safety and security of this international shipping is the responsibility of international maritime organization and next thing even though it is involved in legal matters uh, liability and compensation everything will be handled by this but there is no enforcement mechanism as i said the policies can be enforced only when they are converted into conventions one of the example is with related to pollution uh, international convention for prevention of pollution from ships that is marpol so kindly remember this convention this is very very important marpol convention is constantly in use so marpol is something that is under imo okay in this only the sulfur oxides are they are trying to limit the sulfur oxide emissions from ships this is where i said from 3.5% imo is asking to reduce the uh, sulfur oxide to 0.5% from january 1st 2020 so this is the one and then you have high risk areas as the another issue so this high risk area is basically imo that international maritime organization designate certain areas high risk area when there is so much of piracy 
piracy or threats or even terrorism so these kind of things are there then you designate it as high risk so unfortunately what it did it uh, designated western indian ocean as high risk area so what the problem now so when you once you designate this area as high risk area then ships have to get insurance and that insurance costs will increase so if you get the insurance costs increased the logistics cost will also increase so it will have impact on the trade that is coming to india through mumbai and other western ports so that's why india is opposing this high risk area concept because it is saying in western indian ocean already indian navy is in control and you don't have much piracy instead it is around the somalia and in the west asia so that is indian stand and another problem is with respect to navic we have the gps system called navic right so but it is also india's responsibility to ensure navic is implemented in all the ships so here also there is a problem and then finally bunker convention so bunker convention talks about civil liability for bunker oil pollution damage okay so this is about if there is any oil pollution then that ship how much ship has to pay the damage to the country or to the international organization or how to remedy it these kind of things will be covered under this and in this also india is right now not a signatory i mean india signed but didn't ratify india is waiting because it has certain problems here as well okay and then finally zero coalition this is again very important so zero coalition means zero emissions is their target they want zero carbon dioxide or zero emissions from ships by 2030 so as part of climate change measures they also want to implement these kind of measure so this is zero coalition one thing and then finally the last topic for today is project 75 very brief outline so this is an uh, like we have seen rafael right rafael is something we are buying uh, aircraft from france and recently flown similarly we have a uh, navy cooperation also with france where we are using french company technology transfer to build scorpion class submarines in india so the project is called project 75 under this six scorpion class submarines are being built in india with the technology transfer from french company so in this uh, this is going to be completed by 2022 and six uh, submarines are being constructed you need to know the names also kalvari kanderi karanch vela vagiran vakshir okay these are the six submarines out of this the first three are completed and the last three are being in the construction process and out of this six first four that is kalveri kanderi karanj and vela are normal sub uh, scorpion class submarines vagir and vakshir have air independent propulsion system so now what is air independent propulsion system usually for a submarine after every few hours you have to come up to the sea to take the oxygen back so that the oxygen level will be there for the crew if not they will not have certain oxygen but because of this system you can stay for long under sea so that is the importance of air independent propulsion system and to adjust the pressure systems and all so this is another important thing that can enable more operation of submarines and secrecy so that's why this is important so now having discussed this in defense side you also have to see about aircraft carrier project second one we are constructing and arrested landing concepts like electromagnetic aircraft launch system this is something we are in talks with us to get it into our second aircraft carrier so kindly know the name and research more about that